You may be seated. Amen. I won't keep you long. It's 140. We should be done by 445. I heard somebody say, not if you want to live. Amen. Turn to some, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're sitting next to me today. Turn to somebody else and tell them, because you're better looking than the person that sat next to me yesterday. A lot better looking, yeah. Turn to the person behind you, look at them and say, no, never mind. I want you to say this with all your heart and say it as loud as you can. Say, I'm so much better than this. Say it again. Can you say that a little bit louder? So now turn around and tell people around you, say, I'm so much better than this. Tell them. I don't know how many of you realize that you might be saved, spirit-filled, church and religious and happy and still not be getting all that God has for you. God has so much more for you than what you've experienced. The very fact that you're here, the very fact that you're still here means that God has something else to show you, something else to experience, something else that has to happen in your life, and it's already being destined and purposed. I have one scripture, two verses. Galatians chapter 2. I love this scripture. The apostle Paul's talking here, and he says something very interesting. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. Say the grace of God. Grace of God. Grab your neighbor by the shoulder and tell him the grace of God. Grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Allow me to begin by asking you a question. Are you living a resurrected life? Especially those of you that have been to hell and back, that have been through hell and high water. Did God take you through everything he took you through just to come out where you were before you went through it? Paul begins to labor to make the people in Galatia understand who they are in the kingdom. And he does it by sharing his own testimony. I personally have a tremendous respect for Paul. I can relate to him a lot. I have a huge respect for him. Why? Because Paul reminds me, please hear me. Paul reminds me that God uses the rejected to the greatest degree he can. Well, this side didn't get it, obviously, so I'm going to preach to this side. God uses the rejected, those that nobody ever wanted, those that nobody ever believed in, those that nobody ever trusted or even wanted to, even wanted to give them the time of day. Those are the men that God uses to the highest degree. Somebody shout, you're talking about me. And let me say this, just because men rejected you, just because men rejected you is no indication that God is not going to use you mightily in the kingdom of God. It's Paul. It's Paul. It's Paul who teaches us that we know that all things work together for, uh, for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It's Paul who teaches us that there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk no longer after the flesh but walk after the spirit. That's Paul. And then he says something that's kind of odd. Turn to your neighbor and say, okay, here we go. Then Paul says something that's kind of odd, kind of strange. He says, I am crucified with Christ. The thing is, the reason that's kind of weird is because Paul, who says that it was crucified with Christ, wasn't even a Christian when Christ was crucified. As a matter of fact, at the time when Christ was crucified, Paul hated people who followed Jesus. He was a terrorist uh, to the church, killing anyone who said they... They were with the Lord, and yet he says, I was crucified with him, and he wasn't even there. 
But God's grace, say God's grace. Say it again. But God's grace is so powerful and so limitless that God doesn't have to pick good men to use them. Somebody ought to say, that's why I'm here. Listen to me. God says to the prophet Hosea, hey, you looking for a wife? Yeah, Lord. Well, I don't want you to look in the church. He said, go down to the red light district, find some beat up, cut up, trashed up, low down woman, and I want you to make her your wife. If you want to be happy for the rest of your, oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the Bible says that when Hosea saw her, this tramp, prostitute, the Bible says that when Hosea saw her, he loved her. It wasn't just that he chose her. He loved her. God caused him to fall in love with a tramp. Well, why did God cause him to fall in love with that kind of woman, preacher? Because God is trying to make you understand that this love affair that he has with you, God is trying to make you understand that, that although you're reckless, although you're ugly, although you're ruthless, although you've been rejected, incapable, incompetent, God loves you and wants to use you in the kingdom. God says, I keep trying to tell you. He says, I keep trying to tell you guys. I just don't pick out people who look good. I just don't pick out people who have talent or who have it going on. But I have a tendency to fall in love with the least likely. In the New Testament, Jesus begins to say, and a certain man had two sons. Turn to somebody and say, you know the story. A certain man had two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, give me my portion of goods that fall unto me. And the Bible says that he divided unto them his living. And then, and, and then God shows himself in the story. God shows himself as a loving father. But the star of this story is not the prodigal son. The main subject of this story, it's called the prodigal son. But the main subject of this story is not the prodigal son. The main subject of this story is the everlasting love of the father who loves a rebellious, rejected, knucklehead son who has gone, spend all his substance in uncontrolled living. It's the father who's the stabilizing force in this story that keeps looking out of the window and standing in front of the porch and he's waiting not for his good son, but he's waiting for his bad son to come home. Jesus is trying to make us understand that God has such a love and he has so much grace. God has great grace that he has a tendency to pick out the most reckless, hard, ridiculous cases. And he shows himself strong through them. He told Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Oh, I wish you were hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. When Paul begins to talk about the grace of God, please get this. When he begins to talk about the grace of God, he says, it's been given freely unto you. Get this, don't lose me. The word freely in the Greek means promiscuous. Anybody ever know a promiscuous woman? Promiscuous. It means it has flaunted itself. You know how a woman flaunts himself, herself? It has flaunted herself like a woman that doesn't care who she sleeps with. Talking about the grace of God, how awesome it is. It's like the woman who doesn't care who she sleeps with. God said, I have such a love and I have such a grace that's so promiscuous that if you will, he will. If you will, he will. Promiscuous grace, inclusive and awesome grace. He can pick out the least likely he can pick out the most ugliest, lying, jacked up, hypocrite. Look at your neighbor and said he looked right at you when he said all of that. <laughs> he can pick up those hypocrites. 
Look, him, look up and down your row. See if you find out who the hypocrite is. Go ahead. Look up and down your row. If you can't find them, maybe sitting in your seat today. I don't know. But. And I know we laugh, but yet he's talking about us. People say, I don't want to go to church. Why? I don't want to be a hypocrite. That's all. You're welcome and destiny. We're full of them. I thought, I thought you'd laugh really hard for that. <laughs> he can pick up the most likely, the ugliest, lying, jacked up hypocrite and say, I'm so powerful. God can say to us, I'm so powerful that I want you to save. I want to save you. I'll, I'll, I'll save you. I, I, I want to use you. I'll use you. And if you're in this room and God has saved you from a terrible life of sin, you know exactly what he's talking about. People don't know you. They know, they know you now that God has fixed you up and restored you and, and cleaned you up and, and gave you a scripture and, and put some oil on your head. Now you're brother so-and-so, but that's not who I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about brother so-and-so. I'm talking about the nasty you. Don't look at me that way. I'm talking about the ugly you. I, I, I'm talking about the two-timer you. I'm talking about the schemer you, not brother so-and-so. That's how they know you now, but they didn't know you then. Can you say amen? amen. I'm talking about the blinky, let me have your number you. I'm talking about the you that God had to snatch out of the life of sin. And raised you up and saved you. And he cast devils out of your life and filled you with the Holy Ghost. And because of that, you ought to be standing up. You ought to be praising. You ought to be worshiping. You ought to be running around. You ought to be giving God the glory. God saved you. When you remember where God brought you from, you ought to dance every single day of your life. Turn to somebody and tell them I was a mess. See, Paul was a mess. Paul was a mess. Some of the greatest messages came out of the greatest messes. So Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. Are you still with me? You sure? I can back up all that from the beginning if you want me to. Oh, you don't want me to do that. Okay. So Paul says, follow me now, please. Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. But in reality, he couldn't mean that literally. Because remember, he wasn't there when Christ was crucified. So God saves him. And God delivers him. And nobody wants to deal with this new guy. Nobody wants to take him out for fellowship. Nobody invites him golfing or, or, or nobody invites Paul out to dinner. He's not legitimate. They don't know him. They don't want him. And they don't like him. Turn to someone and say, sounds like my church. But God chose him. God chose him. And isn't it amazing how God will choose whomever without other people's approval? Isn't that the way God works? Shake, shake your head at somebody and tell them, he chose me. So if Paul says, if Paul says, I'm crucified with, with Christ, he means, here's what he means, don't lose me now, stay with me. He means that his old man and his old deeds are attributed to Christ's cross through a process called identification. Although he wasn't there, and because what God did in his life, Paul identified with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He identifies in a kind of retroactive or backdated sort of way. The sins he committed here against the Savior who died way back there. Follow me. If, if you weren't able to take your present sins and cast them on the cross of the past, none of us would be saved. 
you get that? None of us would be saved. Because when Christ was crucified, none of us were there. And yet we can say what Paul said, that when he was crucified, I was crucified with him. But how? You weren't there through identification. I identify what Christ has done in my life. And although it happened a long time ago, and although I sinned today, I thank God that I'm able to take today's sin and throw it back to what happened on the cross. And now I'm saved. And now I identify that when they crucified him, although I wasn't there, in reality, what they were, what he was already doing, he was making room for me to be crucified with him once I understood who he was. Are you hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying? If not, none of us would be saved. We wouldn't understand redemption. We came to Jesus 2,000 years after the crucifixion, but when, when, when we believe on him by faith, our sins are carried to the cross as we accepted him when he, when he was crucified alone. Now, identification is powerful. Say identification. But you can't understand identification. Here we go. We can't understand that identification without properly understanding substitution. Say substitution. Substitution is an idea that is important for you to understand and to, to, so that you can appreciate your salvation. Now, if, if I looked at Mario here, and, and, and if I, I owed a debt to Mario, if I owed him a debt that I cannot pay, stand up, Mario. If I owed him a debt that I cannot pay, and he pays my bill for me, he pays a bill that he didn't make so that I can have, so that I can have a freedom that I don't deserve. I owe this man something. I can't pay this man what I owe him. So this man pays what I owe him so that I don't have be, to be a slave to what I owe him and so that I can have my freedom. Sit down, man. That's substitution. Say substitution. Because he stood in my place for me. He took my place. He assumed the debt with the benefit of having gotten the money in the first place. He said, I didn't do what, what he did, but, but I'm going to pay the price for him so he can be free. He substituted for me, and he stood in for me. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He was spotless. He wasn't involved, but you had a debt. You had a debt, and, and God gave his only begotten son to redeem you. The word redeem means he bought you back. You were all, you belonged to the enemy, but he paid a price that bought you back. And the price was the shedding of his precious blood. And there'll never be a price like that. But he paid the debt for you so you could be free. Substitution. <laughs> Substitution. Identification. I identify with what Christ did on the cross. Substitution. I'm grateful that he took my place. Come on, man. You know you were as guilty as sin, literally. And to just sit there and not react to that, you must ask yourself, am I really saved? Do I really know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Because if you don't understand the two points that I shared with you, you may not really be saved. Do you get this? And that's a dangerous thought. Well, I go to church. Thank God you go to church. I'm in the choir. Thank God you're in the choir. I'm an usher. Thank God you're an usher. I'm the minister of health. Thank God you're a minister of health. And we appreciate you being all that. But here's the question. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Coming to church, don't prove you have a relationship with Christ. Devil comes to church once in a while to see if you're, uh, if you're here. <laughs> The fact that you're on a worship team doesn't mean necessarily mean you're saved. The fact that you, you're in the hills, a, a ministry helps doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. The question is that you've got to ask yourself, do I 
have a relationship with Christ because if I have a good, strong, true relationship with Christ, then I understand the identification and I'm so grateful for the substitution. That should have been me on that cross. That should have been you on that cross. And I don't know about you, but I have a son, my firstborn, uh, I, 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 and I love my son, but, but, but I, don't know, I, I, I don't know if I'd give him up for you. Some of you are wishy-washy, man. You've learned the Christianese language. How are you? I'm blessed. But before you got to church, you were cussing out the brother. I'm blessed. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Same time I bought you. Same time I bought you. I should have bought a Hyundai. People think that because they speak in tongues that that's it. No, that's just the beginning. And if you're going to pursue anything with passion, you can't do it without God. You've tried. You've tried pursuing stuff that God didn't put in your life. You tried pursuing it and you pursued it with passion. And look where some of us are now. And you swore it was the right thing. Oh, I know I'm doing the right thing. I know. And you pursued it and it didn't get you anywhere. Am I talking to myself today? Am I preaching to myself this morning? Amen. Substitution. Substitution. You have to know that that is why you're saved today because the enemy will try, hear me, the enemy will try to slip around that man that paid the price for you and come back to you and bring up your old sins again. And you have to say, wait a minute, that's not me. I am crucified with Christ. In other words, you can't make me pay for what I owe you if God already paid for what I owe you. Oh, come on, praise him like you mean it, will you please? Come on, praise him real loud like you mean it. Somebody shout, I'm free. free. Come on, man, shout, I'm free. Free. You're free. free. And when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, it means that this former murderer and all that he did has been resolved through his identification with his redeemer. And he did it by faith, all by faith. And he has so identified with what Christ did that he said, he said in essence what he was saying, when you did it, I did it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. My old man is crucified with all of its deeds and all of its sin. My, my old man. Now, 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 I want you to take a minute. I don't want you to get that confused with someone who's working on their morality now. All of us are working on our lives right now. Some of us are still working on some stuff in our lives. Yeah, can I look at you and say that? Some of us are still working on some stuff in our lives. You got stuff in your life? Anybody here got stuff in your life? Oh, well, wait a minute though. When, I, when he was crucified, no, that was your past sins indeed. Now, because of that, you have grace to work on whatever you're going through. Somebody shout stuff. Say it again. Some of us are still working on some stuff. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about positionally. Positionally, I'm crucified with Christ. Get this. That's my position. Positionally, I'm crucified with Christ. Now, let me explain the difference. You got to get this. Let me explain the difference between my position crucified with Christ and my condition that I'm in right now. See, there's a difference between your position crucified with Christ and your condition of what you're dealing with right now. The stuff you're dealing with right now. The stuff that's going on in your life. That is your condition. So that's a major difference between your position. Say position. And your position is what? Crucified with Christ. Say that. If you're saved and born again, your position is crucified with Christ. But although you're crucified with Christ and you're born again, you got some condition in your life. You got some stuff in your life. Oh, I wish I was praying to real people here. You got stuff you're doing. You got stuff you're saying. You got stuff you're thinking. Shout stuff. 
So that's a major difference between my position and my condition. Hear me. Positionally, I am crucified with Christ. Say amen. amen. Conditionally, I've still got some stuff in my life that I'm working on every day. I want to talk to some real men here. Are there any real men in the house this morning? But get this, get this. Oh God, you help me, help me. Get this, get this. I have to know my position crucified with Christ. I have to know my position while, while I deal with my condition. <laughs> I have to know my position. I'm crucified with Christ so that I can deal with my condition. Why? I'll tell you why. You ready to shout? I sure is. Close the door, don't let anybody out. This place is about to go crazy right now. Yeah, thank you. Here's why. Here's why. Because understanding my position, crucified with Christ, understanding my position is what's going to help me overcome my condition. Understanding who I am in Christ and what Christ has done for me. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing, no matter what my condition is, my position will help me overcome my condition. Somebody ought to be praising his holy name. The prodigal son, he was his father's son. Whether he was in the palace or in the hog pen, he was still his father's son. That's his position. Wherever he was, he was still his father's son. No matter what you've done, no matter what your condition, you're still your father's son. And if you understand your position, I'm still my father's son. That position will help you overcome your condition. Wait a minute. But the doctor said I had cancer, but I'm still my father's son. That position will help you overcome your condition. But you know, my wife wants to divorce me. But your position will help you overcome your condition. Oh, come on, church. It doesn't look like I have enough to make my mortgage. Well, remember who you are in Christ because your position in Christ will help you overcome your condition. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. It doesn't matter what you're going through. The good news is that your position will overcome your condition. I was crucified with Christ. That's my position. And if I remember that, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what the devil's trying to do, if I remember my position, regardless of my condition, my position will help me overcome. Will help me overcome. Will help me overcome. My, 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 will help me overcome my condition. And what happens is when we get in conditions, that's all we think about. We lose track of our position. And we talk, we talk more about our condition than we do. We talk more about our, than we do our, we ought to talk more about because that's how we overcome. I was crucified with Christ. Adaboko said de Brista Saturday. Was crucified with Christ. 
I was crucified with Christ. It's my, it's my position. That's why it is of utmost importance to, for you to find out who you are in Christ. Wow. See, some of you can't shake the victim mentality. You always complain about what a victim you are. Everybody owes you everything. Republicans owe you something. Democrats owe you something. Weird ones owe you something. Church people owe you something. Fat pastor owes you something. Somebody always owes you something. The victim mentality. And we develop victim mentalities because we lose sight of our... We lose sight of our... Because once you remember your... There's a shift that happens. You finally realize because of your position, you finally realize that it changes your condition. Your position tells you, no, you're not the victim. You're the one with the victory. No, you're not sick. By his stripes you are but we talk more about the sickness than we do about he who healed us, which is our position. And that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that's a dead giveaway that in your heart, you're more concerned about the condition than you are about the position. Well, thank you. I'll give you $20 after the sermon. At least somebody's getting it. When you talk about the situation more than you talk about your position, it's a dead giveaway of where you're at. Now, I'm going to use on you what you use on your pastors. Well, God knows your heart. Everybody uses that against their pastor. Well, pastor, you know, God knows my heart. I know it's a scary thing if you think about what you're saying because you know how messed up your heart is. And so when it comes to losing track of your position and you say, well, you know, God knows my heart. Yeah, God knows that you're concentrated, more concerned about your condition than your position, which is what God gave you to overcome that condition. Now you can give the Lord a praise. It's getting really quiet in this. The prodigal son was still his father's son. Whether he was in the hog pen, he was still his father's son. That's his position. Now, 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 this can, his conditions change. Hear me. He went from living with the father to riotous living. He went from riotous living to being in want. And he went from being in want to attach, attaching himself to a citizen of that country. And he went from... Uh, 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 from that to to feeding in the hog pen with pigs, and then he he had, he had come to 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 an abandonment of all that he knew, and and all of a sudden his condition is all the way down here. That's his condition, but he remembered his position, and no matter how far he had gone, he remembered his position. How do you know? Because he said, wait a minute, I'm so much better than this. Somebody tell your grandma by the shoulder, shake them and say, you're so much better than this. Come on, you got to, come on, man. You got to grab somebody by the shoulder like this. Look, I'm so much better than, don't give me this Chavala stuff. I'm, I'm so much better than this. Grab somebody by the shoulder, shake them and tell them you're so much better than this. So much better. You're so much better. You're so much better. You're so much better than what you are now. You're so much better. You're so much better than this. He was down here. He was down here. He couldn't get any lower. Couldn't go down any further. He was as low as you can get. And when he was down here, something happened. 
something happened. He realized, whoa, wait a minute. I'm so much better than this. Well, what happened? You know what happened. He was down so low. He couldn't go any more and lower any, any further. And all of a sudden, can somebody tell me what happened? Can somebody tell me what happened? He remembered his position. No matter how low he was, he remembered grace and mercy. He remembered favor. He remembered his position. And when he remembered his position, he said, I am so much better than this. Some of you guys, some of you guys got to get a hold of this, man. Walk around work, always hanging lip. You got to get out of that condition. And the only way you're going to get out of that condition is to remember your position. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'll ever... I don't think I can be a good father. Remember your position. I, I, I really don't think I can be a good husband. Remember your position. I don't know if I'm, I can be a good worship leader. Remember your position. The devil tried to steal your life with a lack of knowledge concerning your position, who you are, and who you are in Christ. I'm getting ready to close. There was this lady, this man, and, and, and he, he wanted to go to America. And during that time, the only way to America was by ship, during those times. And so he, he worked hard, saved up some money, saved up just enough money to buy himself a ticket to get on that ship to go to America. And so the first night, the dinner bell rings, the announcement is made, everybody to the, to wherever they are, the cafeteria, what dining hall, is dinner served. So everybody starts running to the dining hall, except him, he, he looks into the window and watches everybody eating, and what he had done before he got on ship, he had just enough money to buy himself a bag of cheese and crackers. So while everybody else was eating, he would find him a little dark corner and he would eat his cheese and crackers. Everybody was feasting and he would eat his cheese and crackers. Well, this went on for four or five nights and days and finally somebody yells, Land ahoy! And everybody goes to that side of the ship and sure enough, man, there's America. Everybody started getting excited. Everybody's happy. And one guy walks up to to the cheese and cracker guy, and he said, man, hasn't this been a phenomenal trip? I mean, dinner, those meals, those did you, the meals that they served, so I, I don't know, you know, I, I just had enough money to buy the fare, and with what I had left, I, 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 I bought cheese and crackers, so I've been eating cheese and crackers while everybody's been dining. And he looked at the guy, and he goes, what? He said, yeah. He says, didn't you look? And the rest of your ticket, where all the meals were included with the purchase of the ticket. And it's funny, but most of you are losing your rights and privileges because you don't know who you are in Christ. Because you've forgotten your position, which qualifies you to the dining room, but you forgot your position. So you're satisfied with cheese and crackers. Cheese and crackers. It all belongs to you. But you're settling for cheese and Well, I don't go to that kind of church. Well, you better get your booty over there. Learn about who you are in Christ. Learn about your rights and privileges with Christ because that's your position. That's your position. 
you are who God says you are. I said, you are who God says you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm not the victim. I'm the one with the victory. Turn to somebody else and say, neighbor, I'm not the victim. I'm the one with the victory. Now stand up and look at the person behind you and say, neighbor, you're not the victim. You're the one with the victory. You just, you just got to get back to your position. And the position, just to clarify, the position that I've been talking about for the last half hour is who you are in Jesus Christ. Who are you in Christ Jesus? Who does God say you are? God doesn't say you're sick. That may be a fact. But the truth is because of your position by his stripes you are healed. One is fact. The other one is truth. And it doesn't say the fact will make you free. It says the truth will make you free. You don't have enough money for your mortgage. That's a fact. But your position says God will provide for you. Your household, your kids might be running amok. That's a fact. But your position says God will heal. God will bring them back. You messed up. You didn't mess up once. You didn't mess up twice. You just flat out messed up and you're still messing up. That's a fact. Come on, can you be real and turn to someone and say that's a fact? But your position, your position in Christ, as guilty as you are, as guilty as we are, our position in Christ, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the favor of God over our lives, guilty as sin to this day, many of us are. But because of our position, The blood of Jesus cries out, not guilty. But it does not cry out, not guilty, so that you can keep being guilty and think you're getting away with it. That's not what grace is about. Paul teaches on that. He cries out, not guilty, so that you can be so overcome and so overwhelmed with his grace and his mercy that you stop being guilty. That you stop being guilty in whatever you're doing. The young man had a, had a father and he couldn't find work in the state that he lived in so he called his son to, and his wife in and said you know I'm kind of forced to go look for work out of state and, and as soon as I get there and I get settled in I'll send for you guys and you guys can come in and be with me and so he takes off and thank you sir he takes off <clears throat> His son one night goes out with some high school friends and they go out there and they start doing some drugs, you know. And they offer it to his son. He says, no, man, I'm good, thanks, I'm good. He says, oh, come on, man, just try it. No, 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 it's all right, man, I'm good, I'm good. And one guy says, what? Are you afraid of your father? He'll never know, 
he's out of town. He, he'll never know you did this. Is that what you're afraid of? And he said, no, man. No. It's not what I'm thinking about. But when you offered me that, what I thought about, my father loves me so much and has been too good to me for me to do that. And some of you need to use that in your condition. All right. I realize today that I haven't gotten away with it, Father. You've just, you sent me, you were waiting for me to hear this message. To understand my identification. To understand my substitution. And to understand my position. And because you've been so good to me and you're such a good father, I'm going to stop doing this. I don't want to hurt you in that way. And then I'm going to stop doing this. And then you're going to have to help me stop doing this. And then you're going to have to help me. I need your help to stop doing this. And then I need your help to stop doing this. And God says, I've given you my help. Remember your position. I don't know where you might be at today. I don't know your story. You don't know my story and I ain't going to tell you because none of your business. But we all got a story. And if this word ministered to you in any way, shape or form and there's a condition that you're in that you need your position to help you overcome I want you to quickly get out of that place that you're in. I want you to come up here. I'm going to lay my hands on you, but here's how I'm going to pray. I'm not going to pray a long prayer. I'm going to lay my hands on you and say, remember your position. 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 It's my position in Christ. That's all it is, folks brothers that's all it is it's our position in Christ that'll overcome our condition now it's not just the thought let me just say this for clarity it's just not the thought of your position is that when your position in Christ becomes a reality and you start living it regardless of the circumstance you live your position in Christ because this kid remembered his position and he ran home and just like the father his father would go look for him every day he'd look for him and the Bible says when he saw him afar away some of you are far away from God right now but God is still looking for you every day he steps out and he says to see where you're at and the prodigal son remembered his position I'm better than this I'm the son of a king. My father's got servants, he's got maids, he's got cattle, he's got money, he's good. I'm better than this. I'm better than being in the hog pen. And that's because he remembered his position, remembered who he was. And that position caused him to overcome his condition. And he got back home. And I feel like the Spirit of God is saying to some of you, it's time to come back home. It's time to come back home. Position versus condition. And it's all birthed out of grace. All birthed out of grace. So Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, as I lay my hands on my brothers. Father, I thank you for a true revelation of what you've spoken over us. That never again, after we leave it, we'll never again forget who we are in Christ. I will never again forget my position. I will never overlook it ever again. And I will never talk more about my condition than my position. Never. Because it is my position in you that overcomes my condition here. Can you say amen? 
Lift your hands. I'll pray for you. Ada boko satara na manda. Ele rebro koso to. Ada baka satara na manda. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Remember your position. Your position. Your position. Your position will help you overcome your condition. In the name of Jesus. My position. My position. My position is not something new to you, Pastor. It's just a day of reminding us. Nobody knows that better than, than you do. Nobody. My position overcomes my condition. I'm, I'm better than this. I'm so much better than this. So much better than this. I'm better than this. I'm better than this. Because of your grace, your mercy, and your love for me, I'm better. I'm better than they say. I'm better than they think. I'm so much better. It's my condition. Being overcome by my position. Listen, the Bible talks to us about being humble. But don't go from one extreme to the other. The Bible also says the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent in spirit take it by force. And you know how you take that stuff by force? You remember your position in Christ. And you begin, you begin to declare that. By his stripes I'm healed. I am more than a conqueror. I'm blessed coming in going out. I'm more than an overcomer. And you start to declare your position. I'm the beloved of God. I'm his favorite. You start to declare your position more than you do your condition. And that's not the cessation of being humble. That's not biblical humility. You don't just lay down and say to the devil, go ahead, devil, have your way. No. No. The devil's always trying to remind you of your condition. When are you going to stand up, turn around on him and say, no, let me tell you about my position. And you start telling them who Christ says you are. Come on, church. It's your, your, your position. Your position in Christ. It's your position. Take back what the enemy has stolen. Declare to him. Uh-uh. You ain't stealing from me no more. You're not stealing from me no more. Not my marriage, not my children, not my ministry, not my job, not my career, not my hobbies, not my joy, not my health. You're not stealing from me anymore. My condition has changed this morning because I know my position in the name of Jesus. My position. My position, my position overcomes my condition. My position, my position overcomes my condition. My position overcomes my condition. My position, my position overcomes my condition. my position in Christ my position my position in Christ be healed in the name of Jesus be healed brother Ruben. be healed it's your position your position is to be healed he is your healer that's your position take it back take it back do whatever you gotta do to get back into position Get back into loving God. Get back into serving God. Get back into living for God. Get back in proclaiming the 
God's victory over your life. Get back to your position. Get back. 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 Get back to that place. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise, will you please? Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Come on, somebody praise him as if God set you free this morning. I didn't get to the part to how when you remember your position, you can't help but give him a crazy praise. You can't help it. You'll, bear, you'll break out in such a praise that people look at you and say, really? Does it take all of that? Oh, you have no idea. If you knew my story and what God brought me out of and when he revealed his position, my position in him, it, it, it takes more than this. This is just the beginning. Some of you men need to get back into church and take leadership. Quit letting the poor ladies run everything. You remember... You remember your position. Go back to your pastor, knock on his door, say, I'm here, pastor. What do you need? And once you start something, once you start something, finish it. That's no new principle, man. When I was running around a muck out there in the neighborhood, if you started something, didn't finish it, you wouldn't come back in the neighborhood. And all of a sudden we become Christian and, well, you know, uh, I didn't feel well. Well, learn how to lead while you bleed. See, you young guys don't know that. But you ask the, 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 the guys that are a lot older, like Pastor Samuel, the, a lot older. You know, the, you, Pastor, the pastors, you ask them, and they'll tell you, sooner or later, you're going to grow up, and you're going to realize that a true leader learns to lead while they bleed. That's old school stuff, man. I said, that's old school stuff. Hey, Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I want to thank Pastor Jerry and his team for the, for the opportunity to, to, to speak into your life. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let me just pray for you. And can we put the, the, the tentative date up there? Amen. Praise the Lord. What an amazing Friday and this morning and even Pastor Charlie's message. Somebody just told me they just had, they had to leave and they said many people needed to hear this message. And you know, they had left, but that's okay. But they needed to hear this message. Uh, our next Men's Connected Men's Ministry is August 7th and 8th. It's a tenet of 2020. Amen. So you could write that down, put that in your heart, write it down on a piece of paper. But we're looking forward to uh, uh, getting together with you and your churches and, the, and, and doing this event again. It's been really good. I mean, really, my, I, I want to thank Sam and the worship team. Amen. Weren't they tremendous? Now, Sam is my, he's going to be my son-in-law. Yeah. yeah. Sam and my daughter, they're getting married tomorrow. Yeah. Sam, come here real quick, son. Come here, son. Real quick. Sam, I want to thank you for, for stepping up with the worship team, putting it all together. I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank my wife and Tom from Tom's Tailgate. They came up, brought the food, the trailer. I want to thank all the Destiny Community Church leadership. I mean, they're ready to put away the chairs and everything, and they're just right on it. But, you know, congratulations. They're getting married tomorrow, and, uh, and I'll be giving away my daughter tomorrow. Praise God. Amen. God is so good. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So, yeah, yeah. Am I on? Thank you. You talk about leading while bleeding. The guy's going to get married. He's not going to bleed any more than that tomorrow. Yeah. I love him. I love Amanda. Uh, Amanda's like family here. She grew up in this church. And, and But what I wanted to say is that when we called him in and said, will you take over the, the, the music department? Never again did we hear anything. Or He looked at me and says, Pastor, I got it. 
and and never said, I, I can't, Pastor, you know, that weekend I'm getting married and, and I've got this to do and I've got never. Never. He said, Pastor, that's what you need. I got it and never heard. I never heard the group. They rehearsed until uh, last night and, and this morning and it was phenomenal. And, and so I just want to express my personal thank you to every single one of them. They sacrificed to be here. Thank you, Pastor. Son, thank you too. Staying in position. Amen. Uh, next year, I'm looking forward to working with several men from other churches and putting the next event together. And uh, we were talking to Pastor Charlie the other day, and somehow we're going to incorporate uh, uh, our, our young adults into it. We're going to get some young adults out there and come preach the word too, and, and, you know, and so they can come give the word. But we're going to do this next year. Amen. Can somebody say thank you, Jesus? Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you for being here. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God. We thank you for all your goodness and your mercy, what you've done here in this conference, God. I thank you that not one man who showed up here today, Friday and Saturday, Lord God, will be the same. They'll go, they'll come in one way, but they'll leave a different way, God. They'll leave, change, delivered, and set free, God. God, I thank you and I praise you for what you're going to do. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you bless them. Lord, I pray that you keep them. I pray that your face shine upon them. Lord, I pray you be gracious to them. Lord, I pray that you turn your face toward them and give them peace. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church say with me, amen.